so that we can start going over our review. I did post the video and the notes from the last class. So you should have those. There it goes. And we're just gonna continue. There were, I think, 28 problems total. So we're going to finish up with our um, review. So last problem we did was number 14, just because I was really adamant about getting at least through halfway. Um, and then today we'll continue with uh, number 15. So let me come over here. So we're doing two, four, one, four, final review. Continued. I'm not sure if we'll run out of time, but if we do, I will record the last couple of solutions on my own and then post them as well, okay? Just so that you have them for when you are studying for the final, okay? And those will be up today if I run out of time. Um, not 14, I needed to start at 15. So this one says find the indefinite integral. Now, before I go to do my steps finding that, I actually want to rewrite this as 9x and then e to the negative 4x. Oh, and I because I graded those tests, I don't I can't even tell you how many times many of you, many of you on many problems don't understand your algebra. If I have this, that does not equal this. That equals six over five, which is not the same thing as four thirds, right? But I can't tell you how many of you did this and said the answer was four thirds. Of course, it wasn't numbers, right? It was like n squared plus 2n plus 1 over n squared, and y'all went and did that. But that doesn't work that way. <laughs> okay, it does not work that way. You can never, 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 ever cancel terms. You can only cancel terms. So if it were four times two and three times two, then yes, you could cancel the twos and get four thirds, right? Because eight over six raises to four thirds, okay? They're the same decimals. So those are equivalent. But this, no, this is not equivalent, okay? Some of you did it like once on this last test, and then some of you did it on every single problem on that test. <laughs> that is a big, big no-no. You should have learned like in, what is it, elementary or intro to algebra or something like that. That's like one of the first things that they teach you. And we should have been getting pow pals the whole time, right? <laughs> As you went through algebra, pre-cal, cal one, all that jazz. So stop doing that. You cannot do it. Um, please don't do it on the final. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit more lenient when it comes to your paperwork on the final. So if you could figure it out, you know, I'll, I'll take what I can get, but please don't cancel terms on the final. You won't get the same answers. You won't get the right answers. Okay. So for this one, I would probably initially try to do it with U sub, but the problem with doing U sub is that if I let u equal this exponent up here, I would get du as negative four dx. I wouldn't have anything to do with this extra x in there, okay? And if I were to solve this for x and then replace x with u over negative four, there would still be a problem of the extra u and the u up here, okay? So there is an issue with this extra x. So the way we're going to do it is we're going to do integration by parts. Because then I can split those two um, factors and apply this rule. And so you definitely remember we're making your own note sheet for this. I am not giving you anything. No formulas for me. You have to fit everything you need on your note sheet. Okay. So this would definitely be one that you'd want to have on there. Okay. It's the one that says, if you're taking the integral of u dv, 
the response is going to be u v minus the integral of v du. Okay. Now, when it comes to figuring out what is u and what is dv, you really want to pick u as the thing that is easily differentiable, meaning I could take the derivative of it easily. And not only that, is hopefully it eventually goes to zero. Okay, so normally that means my algebraic expressions, not my exponential expressions. Okay, so I would say u is going to equal the 9x, and then du is going to equal the e to the negative 4x dx. Okay, and you can do the tabular method if you want to. Um, I prefer to do the tabular method versus potentially having to repeat the formula for integration by parts. So I would rather just do all my derivatives and all my integrals until I get to zero, right? So what's the derivative of um, 9x? 9. And then the derivative of 9 is zero. And so we already have all the rows, right? Then here, if I were to integrate this, that should be a v, sorry. If I integrate this, I would get v equals. And then what's the integral of this? It's going to be, mm -hmm. it's going to be this, but divided by what? Right, the derivative of that, mm -hmm. which we can write as negative one fourth e to the negative four x. And if I do it again, this is going to be this again, right? But then you have this extra factor. So if I do the integral of this, I'm going to get all of this again but with a negative one fourth multiplied by it. One over 16. Right, positive one over 16. Mm -hmm. And I only needed to do it once, right? Two integrals because we already got to the zero. Now here's the little uh, process. So that's gonna get multiplied by that. That would get multiplied by this and zero would get multiplied by the next one, which is why I didn't need the next one, right? It'll still just be zero. Now remember your sign variation. So the first one starts off positive, then the next one would be negative, and then it just keeps alternating signs like that, right? Depending on how many rows you go. I'm not gonna really use this zero, so that guy really doesn't matter. But let's put it together. So we end up with nine X times negative one fourth E to the negative four X minus nine, times one over 16 e to the negative four x. And so we just clean that up a little bit and we should be finished. So negative nine x over four e to the negative four x minus nine over 16 e to the negative four x. Now I am doing indefinite integration, right? So I should have a plus c. And in all honesty, there should have been a plus C in here. Now this one, number 16, doesn't tell me specifically how to do this problem. And so this problem, there are two different ways. You had to do this problem on, I think, test three. Was it test three? Yeah, chapter eight, test three. And the way I made you do it, or the instructions told you to do it, was to use U substitution, not U substitution, I'm sorry, trig substitution. And then some of you didn't do the trig substitution, so of course you lost that on the points, right? But it could have been done in a different way, which was the way y'all normally did it. Here, you don't have that restriction. It doesn't say you have to do it with trig sub. So I can just use plain old u sub then, okay? As long as the directions don't tell me. And it don't, they don't. It just says, find the indefinite integral. That's it, okay? So we could totally use u sub here. So if I let u equal what's inside the radical, then du would be zero plus two x, of course the dx. 
And I have that extra X and the DX. I just don't have the two. So then I'm gonna replace what's in the house with a U. And then the X DX is going to become DU over two. And then I'm just rewriting this. So I took that um, two in the denominator and factored it out as a one half, right? And then I changed the uh, radical to a one half exponent. And from there, we can use our regular power rule, right? So it'll be, if I add one, it'll be three halves. And then if I divide by three halves, that's the same as multiplying. There's someone had the dark. Oh. C W N. I don't know what C W N stands for. I have no idea. Ask somebody in math world though, because I think they have a map in there. Okay. They're right across the hall. A big window, yeah. Sorry about that. Okay. Um. Yes, add one and then multiply by that reciprocal. And because it's an indefinite, right, we have to add our plus C. Now, these guys will cancel. And we should probably put back what U was. So that's 25 plus X squared. And then we have this three halves exponent. So it's much nicer from when they don't tell you you specifically have to solve it a certain way, right? Because <laughs> trib sub is, is a little lengthy. Oh, I need to fix that. It's bothering me. Focus. There we go. Okay, let's see, 17 is this one, but this one does tell me specifically what I have to do. So number 17 says, use partial fractions to find the indefinite integral. Hmm? Why? You like partial fractions? Oh, oh gotcha. Um, and, and we have to actually use it in here because if I were to let you equal that guy down there, right? Um, yes, exactly. You are not, you don't have all the pieces you need because you would need an X. The two you could always put in, right? You could just divide by the two and you got it. But that X, that guy's the problem, okay? So we have to pretty much do it. So I like to do it over here on the side and then I'll do my integral later. So this is actually what X plus four and then X minus four. So then I would have A over one of those guys and then B over the other guy. And how you do this from here is up to you. I'm just gonna do it algebraically. I don't have the calculator with the matrices or anything. So if I multiplied all three of these by this denominator, it would cancel and I would just have one here, this one would cancel, but I'd have A times that factor. And then the X minus four would cancel and I'd get B times X plus four. And since there's no X's over here, that means that AX plus BX, if I combine them together, I should get zero X, right? So essentially just, figuring out a, b equals zero. Now for the second equation, these constants that don't have x's should equal that constant of positive one. So however you wanna solve this is up to you. I'm just gonna use substitution. So then if a is negative b, I have 4B plus 4B, which is 8B, which means B is 1 eighth. And then A is negative B, so that means A is negative 1 eighth. 
So now I can come over here and write negative 1 eighth over x plus 4 plus positive 1 eighth over x minus 4. I have to make sure that I put the correct one over the correct fraction. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to split this and factor out those one eighths. Because since you have x plus 4 at the bottom, and the derivative of x plus 4 is 1, and the same here, you have x minus 4 in the bottom, and the derivative 1, then you have this rule, which we know equals the ln of the absolute value of u, of course, plus c, right? So I'm going to get negative 1 eighth ln of x plus 4 plus 1 eighth ln of x minus 4 plus c. And sometimes they combine them and do all kinds of weird stuff, but you should be good here. If it happens to be a multiple choice and they just have one term, I'll go ahead and explain what that looks like. So essentially, you get the 1 eighth and they turn into exponents. And then the positive argument, the positive logs argument on the numerator and the negative logs argument will go in the denominator. So it goes in one log and it'll be the X minus four on the top and then the x plus four at the bottom. And about the last thing I've seen is they put it all together like that. Okay. So if any of these are in your options, they're all equivalent to each other. So you're just picking the one that matches what you got. I've even seen them take the one eighth out again and just leave it like this. It just depends on whether you're talking about web assign, a particular book, the department final exam, like they all do different things. And this is like the first where I did not create your final exam. Whoever was the lead for Cal 2 created the final exam. Normally it used to be me for like, I don't even know, 10 years, but now they're trying to like redistribute work. <laughs> so somebody else is doing it now. I boxed that one just because I like that one. And that's the one you get like right after you do integration, right? So that's normally the one I like, but I've seen them in all these other forms. Okay, number 18, very plainly just says find the indefinite integral. And so because I have cosine to the fourth power, remember we only have exponential rules for just cosine and just sign, okay? So if we wanna do for the fourth power, we have to use what are called that um, power reducing formulas. So I'm gonna go double check, but I think cosine squared of an angle is one plus cosine of double that angle over two. I think it's a plus, but let me verify real quick. So I would definitely have both of those power reducing formulas. A lot of the trig identities too, the, the Pythagorean theorem ones, like sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, whatever, whatever with the tangents and the and the secants and then the cosecant and co and cotangent. Um, power reducing. Why is it as soon as I press P, Pokemon comes up? That's okay. <laughs> okay, yes, it is with a plus sign. Good, 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 good. 
Okay, so I'm gonna use this guy, but I'm gonna use it cleverly. So first we have to write this as a square. You have two options, okay? Your two options are to write that as cosine squared 5x and another cosine squared 5x or cosine squared of 5x, the whole thing squared. Aren't both of those cosine to the fourth power, right? And then it's actually the same thing. Isn't this the same thing as writing it twice, right? Multiplying them together. So you have that choice of which one to do. Does anybody want to pick one? This one? Okay, we'll do that one. So then if I apply the power reducing for this one, it's going to be 1 plus cosine of 2 theta over 2. And the other one, 1 plus cosine of 2 theta over 2. And then dx. So where is the power reducing? Oh, I'm sorry. I put 2 theta because that says 2 theta, right? But what is theta here? The 5x. 5x. So then if I do two times that 5x, what do I have? 10x. Mm -hmm. Thank you for asking. I don't have my little white out thing. So this should be 10x. 10x. It'll look prettier in the next line. <laughs> okay. And then can foil this all out, multiply it together, but I don't like the denominators in there. So I'm actually, this is two times two right at the bottom. So I'm gonna factor out a one fourth. And then I'm just gonna foil these numerators. So I get one plus a cosine 10X and another cosine 10X will make two cosine of 10X plus, and then times them together, you get cosine squared of 10X. I probably should use a bracket instead of a parentheses. Problem is we have that issue again, right? We have cosine squared and there's no formula for cosine squared. So we're gonna have to do the power reducing formula again, but now notice that my angle is 10X. So when I apply it, it'll be what? 20X, yes. one plus cosine of 20x over two. So all I did was split that fraction and I put one over two and then cosine of 20X over two. But then I noticed that I have these like terms, right? So we get three halves. And then I'm gonna write this as one half cosine of 20X. Oops. And you can write all the steps of U sub, or if you know how to shortcut U sub, that's fine too. Um, I'm just going to do the shortcut for U sub because it's just 10x. So when I take the derivative of it, it's just the constant, right? Which means I'm going to have to divide by that constant. So when I do the integral, this is going to be 3 halves x. This is going to be 2. What's the integral of cosine? Negative sine. Negative sine. And because I have that 10x, I have to divide by that 10. That's a consequence of the u sub. I just didn't show all those steps. And the same thing here, the integral of cosine is negative sine. And if I'm doing u sub, I'd have to divide by a 20. And there were no bounds, so I do have to put the plus c. From here, it's just a matter of cleaning it up. 
So this would be three over eight X. That's one fifth, actually a negative one fifth times four is one over 20. And then that's 40, a negative 40, one over 40 times four is a negative one over 60. Now you might have more steps in between there and that's okay. You just work it out the way you're used to working it out. You should end up with the same result. Okay. Good morning. Is it still real windy out there? Yeah. Never ran to my car so fast. <laughs> or to the building, actually. My daughter's like, I gotta go get my eyelashes. I'm like, good luck. <laughs> I'm not going back out there. Yes, it is. I get here usually about 7.30. Okay, number 19. I'm going to write it down, um, just this part, and then I'm going to read you the directions. This is very similar to one of the ones that was on this, just this recent test. And again, I'll put all the feedback. Um, so the directions say to determine the convergence or divergence of the sequence with the given nth term. If it converges, find limit, okay? Um, so it should, let's see. So if we need to find the limit, we need to essentially, no, this is a sequence. So sequences, sequences can converge so we'll have to find limit if you do the limit let's see if it diverges right quick for test for divergence so we'll take the limit as n goes to infinity of this thing here and everybody did it differently some of you applied the um uh, the rule about the exponent of the denominator. And then some of you did L'Hopital's rule. Either way, you still get the same um, limit, but this will tell me the test for divergence. And it's actually finding the limit at the same time, right? So I'm doing both kind of. I'm actually doing the second part, but I'm also seeing if it diverges. If it's quick to assume that it diverges. So I'm going to take um, seven n divided by the seventh root of n, seventh root of n divided by seventh root of n, and then nine divided by seventh root of n. Try to squeeze it in there. So then I get one in the top, one at the bottom, and then nine over the seventh root of n. So as n goes to infinity, even if I take the seventh root of in super large number like infinity, it'll still be a super large number toward infinity, which means I have a number over infinity, which means that guy goes to zero, right? So you just get one. So I actually know what the limit is. The limit is one, right? I know that part. That's the limit. But I still don't know... Um, I think the directions on this problem were wrong. And I don't think I should have been doing any kind of test for divergence. And I'll explain why in a second. We don't usually determine whether sequences converge or diverge. They're just a list, a list of numbers. We usually determine whether series, which is the one with the sigma, okay? So you have that nth term or whatever, but it would have to be everybody added up in order to figure out whether or not it converged or diverged, okay? 
And essentially when we were doing sequences, if you ended up with a real number, then you would say, yes, it quote unquote converges, okay? So since L is a real number, and actually more specifically, a real finite number, And I really don't like this, but I'm going to put it in here anyway. The sequence converges. So there's not, it's not a series. So you can't apply like the nth term test or the ratio test or anything like that, because those tests are for series, right? That whole chart is for series not for sequences, which are just a list of numbers, the numbers being added together, okay? So it's a little bit different. And I didn't count anybody off points if you told me you were applying this series or that series, um, because I noticed in the directions on the test that I said, state the, ser state the test if you apply to test. Um, so I didn't count it against anyone if you if you said I put a, I applied this test. But what I was looking for is did you take the limit and did you get one, right? That's the main idea of what I was looking for. Okay, number 20. 20 is actually a series. So this one looks like this. And this one is also very similar to um. It's very, very, very similar to the one that was on the test. This one said, find the sum. Find the sum of the convergent series. And I think I had two people like do the test to tell me that this series converges, but it already told me it converges, right? So you didn't need to show me that it converges. I told you it converged, okay? So all you had to do was just find the sum. And that's actually one of those geometric ones, okay? Now I wanna point out, cause I did see somebody do this. Um, for the geometric ones, you have to have A and then something with the nth power, right? And then the sum would be A over one minus R. That's the formula, okay? What I saw somebody do, which you cannot do, is I don't know why, but they did this. And so then they said A was negative one and R was two fifths, okay? That is incorrect. If you have negative two to the power of five raised to the N, the only thing you could do is split it as the negative one, but then that exponent goes to both. And then this guy's not always negative one, is it? It depends on what N is. If N is an even number, it's actually a positive one, right? So A cannot be um, something that's changing. A is a very consistent value. It's the same value all the time. This is the value that's changing. And that's the one that goes in the denominator, okay? So be very, very, very careful with this. If there's not a number sitting right outside just from the get-go, then you, that A is going to be an invisible one, okay? It has to be. And then R is going to be the negative two fifths. And all we need to know in order for us to say that this converges is that the absolute value of R is less than one, right? So that means, is this less than one? It is, right? It'll be a positive two fifths, which is less than one, okay? So it does converge, but that's not what I asked you to do, right? <laughs> Somebody wrote, well, R is negative two fifths, so then it's it doesn't converge, but it does. So let's find our sum, which is what we were asked to do. It would be A over one minus R. So it's gonna be one over one minus two fifths, which is one plus two fifths which is five fifths, that makes seven fifths. And then the reciprocal of seven fifths is five seven. Again with the leaf blower. Where'd my questions go? Oh, there they are.
This one was not on the test, okay? But I saw it in this review. So we definitely need to talk about it. And this one does specifically, oh, I think I skipped a problem. This is actually number 22. I'm gonna go out of order, I guess. Um, no, I'm not, that's gonna bother me. <laughs> so let me do 21, the correct 21. There was one on the test with these directions. It was just a totally different um, function here. I think on your test, you had like E to the N or something like that on the test. And this one is six to the power E. All that means is that the derivative part is gonna be a little bit more complicated than it was on the test, but we can still do the derivative, okay? Um, so it does say I have to apply the integral test. And so what I'm gonna first do is let f of x equal one over six to the power x, which is the same thing as six to the power negative x. Um, and then we're gonna do our bounds from one to infinity. And then our function six to the negative x dx. Some of you did this informally where you just left it like that and you plugged in infinity and then you plugged in one. That's okay. I didn't count it against you if you did it. But because I'm doing it on paper for everyone else to look at, I'm going to do it the formal way. And the first thing I'm going to do is deal with that negative. So I'm going to say u equals negative x and then du would be negative one dx. So basically negative du will replace the dx, right? So this will become e to the, not e, six, six to the power u, and then dx will become negative du. Um, I'll rewrite that one more time before I actually take the integral. All I did was factor the negative in front of the um, integral. I could have even factored it all the way out here. It doesn't matter. So I am gonna have a negative, I just don't know. I think I remember what the integral is, but I have to go look. Integral, there it is. So anything, no, that's the regular power rule. There it is. So a number raised to a, a u is gonna be one over ln of that number and then the same exponential again, okay? So mine will be one over the ln of six and then times six to the u still. Remember, these are for x values, not for u. So I plug in b and one yet, right? We have to back sub first. And I think I'm gonna go to another paper instead of trying to squish that in there. So we have negative one over ln of six and then six to the negative x because that's what u was. Now I can plug in my bounds. So I end up with negative ln of six, six to the negative b minus a negative ln of six, six to the negative one. This is gonna be negative one over ln of six times one over six to the power B. Negative and negative is plus one over ln of six and then times one over six. 
So as B goes to infinity, six to the power infinity will go to infinity. And because it's in the denominator, this guy will go to zero. So this whole guy will go to zero. But if I'm multiplying this times a zero, it means the whole thing goes to zero, right? So in here, there's no Bs. So nothing is going to infinity over there. So we just end up with one over ln of six times six, which means I can put the six in the front. Now it literally does not matter what that number is as long as it is, um, A finite number. It says it has to be a positive real number. So this is a positive real number. And if you're not sure because of the ln of six, you don't know, right, if that's positive or not. If it's a number over one, it will be positive. But if that were a decimal, then it would be negative. Okay. So one over six ln of six, it is a positive answer, right? So since it's a positive real number, that means that the integral converges. And then according to the integral test, if the integral converges, then that means that the series converges. So I had somebody on this problem say at the end, positive real number, means it converges, that doesn't fly. I need to know what it is that you're talking about. Are you talking about the interval converging or are you talking about the series converging, okay? And you can't talk about the series converging until you talk about the integral converging, okay? It's a little bit tricky there, but we did eventually get converges. Oh, I also had some people doing something else that was driving me crazy on the test. Where's those formulas? I'm just gonna look it up real quick. There was two of them, two, two errors that I noticed that people were doing. The nth term test. If you get zero, it literally tells you it's inconclusive. And there were multiple people that did it on multiple problems that did the limit and got zero and then said it converged. Only if it doesn't equal zero do you know for a fact that it diverges. If it equals zero, you still don't know, okay? So for people that were doing that, no, 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 you cannot do that. That's not what the test says. Um, and then the alternating series test. The alternating series test doesn't ever tell you when a series diverges, never, never, never. All it says is that it converges if you meet these two criteria. So two things were happening. People were trying to do one criteria and not the other. And then the other thing that happened was, is they found out that these were not true. And then they said that the alternating series diverged. That's not what the alternating series tells you. It's one direction only, not vice versa, okay? So it only tells you whether it converges, period. If this fails at all, it probably does diverge, but then you probably need to go sh make sure and use the nth term test, okay? So there just was a couple of little logic things going on in there. Where is my camera? There it is. Okay. Number 22 is another one of those where I have to do it in a certain way. But it says I have to use the comparison test. Good thing for me, it does not tell me which comparison test to use because I do not like direct comparison. I do not like to sit there and try to think of who's bigger, who's smaller, which one's converging, which one's not. I'd rather just do the limit. And if I get a number, right, I know that they both do the same thing. And usually that you threw in there is the one that's easy to figure out. So for this comparison test, I'm specifically going to use the limit comparison test. And to do that, I have to identify what a n is, which is the original nth term of your series here, which is this. And then I have to come up with one 
that is easily able to determine its convergence, okay? Normally, you just get rid of the constants. And then that can be written as a over nine to the power n, which is a geometric one, right? Geometric ones are easy to see if they converge or don't. All you had to do is look at r, okay? We won't do it yet, we'll wait. But that geometrics are always really nice, right? And the P-series. So if they tell you to do comparison, that's probably what you're looking for. Is a geometric or a P-series? Let's do the limit comparison. That means I need to take the limit as n, not b, n goes to infinity of a n over b n, okay? No bars. So that means I'm going to have this guy divided by that guy. And I'll leave it in this form. But when I go to figure out its convergence, I'll use this form, okay? But I want to keep this form so I can do things, right? Um, but when you divide by a fraction, you multiply by the reciprocal, right? Do not cancel these nine to the power n's. One is a factor, the other is a term, okay? They both have to be factors. They both have to be multiplied by something in order for you to cancel them. Okay, I can cancel these guys, not a problem. Okay. What you can do, since I don't have, like, I mean, I guess I could divide everybody by nine to the power in. Or you could do L'Hopital's rule. Either way, you should get the limit as one at the end, but I'm gonna do it with the division. This is an exponential, but the highest exponent is n. So I'm gonna do nine n divided by nine to the n, nine to the n divided by nine to the n, and then four divided by nine to the n. So I would have got one over one plus four over an exponential. As n goes to infinity, the exponential goes to infinity, which means the fraction goes to zero. And so you do end up with one. If I had done L'Hopital's rule, because some of you did like that rule and y'all were using it pretty often on the test, which is not wrong, it's totally okay. I started scribbling on somebody's paper and then I was like, oh, never mind. You're using L'Hopital's rule. <laughs> so I just said, ignore my scribble. Um, we would have to take the derivative of this stuff. And bear with me. I think the derivative is nine to the power n times ln of n, but let me make sure. Just because I want to be sure. Mm, where's my a there it is yeah so it's going to be the same nine to the power n the derivative of n is just one and then ln of nine right next to it so we get ln of nine times nine to the power n and at the bottom we get ln of nine times nine to the power n and the derivative of four is just zero right well this is the same thing top and bottom and they're factors, right? That multiplied by that. Why did I change colors? So this essentially reduces to that, which we know the limit is one as well, okay? So whichever way you do that is completely up to you. What does the comparison test tell us though? It tells us, there we go. It tells us that if we take the limit and we get a positive real number, then both of them converge or both of them diverge. And I did get a positive real number, right? So L equals one, which is a positive real number, which tells me that this series and this series 
either both converge. I don't know why I put two E's or both diverge. And so now's where we're going to get to go look at B, right? Because B is easier to look at. If this was easy to do, I would have done it, but it's not. So we have to look at that one. Here, R equals eight over nine, and the absolute value of R is less than one, isn't it, right? The absolute value of eight ninths is less than one, which implies that BN converges. And because BN converges, and we know they do the same thing, right? Then that means AN converges, which is your original. And that's the one we were wondering about, right? We're on 22 and we have one hour. So hopefully they can finish. I'm definitely not going to do that little tiny piece. <laughs> so 23. This one just states, determine the convergence or divergence. Okay. Just can determine the convergence or divergence. So it does alternate in sign, right? So by D, I would automatically do um, alternating, series. Mm -hmm, alternating series test. Just remember there's two parts to that test, not just one. So I have to make sure AN is greater than or equal to AN plus one, right? Your next terms need to be getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Because if they are, then you it will converge, right? If they're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, that's when it won't converge. And we need to show that the limit as n goes to infinity of a n equals zero. So this by itself does not say that it converges, okay? But I'll be honest with you, if you do this and you do not get zero, right? That would be your clue. Hey, in term test says, if I take the limit of this nth term and I don't get zero, it diverges. All you have to do is say that. I did the limit, it's not zero. And the inner test tells me that it, it diverges, right? What you can't say is that this does not equal zero and the alternating series test says that it diverges because that's not what the alternating series test tells you. Only the nth term test tells you that. So let's go ahead and try. A n is going to be this without the alternating sign. So just one in the numerator and then n plus two. And then that's that a n plus one would actually be n plus one plus two, like that, which is just n plus three. So is a n, this guy, greater than or equal to this guy? You could probably decide that right now without having to keep going. Which denominator is bigger? The one on the left or the one on the right? on the right, and the bigger the denominator, the smaller the fraction value, right? So this is true. And it's true for all n, doesn't matter what the n is, it's always gonna be true. And then the last bit we have to show is that that limit of a n equals zero. And it does, doesn't it? And it goes to infinity, right? The fraction, will go to zero. So this one is true too.
And then it says if I have both of those criteria, then it implies that the series converges. Now this one does tell you specifically which test to use. The directions on 24 specifically say, use the ratio test to determine the convergence or divergence. So we have to do that one. Um, and that's the one where if you take the limit, I don't know why my ends wanna look like Bs today, but when you take the limit of AN plus one over AN, you get L, and if that's less than one, then it converges, right? If it's greater than one, it diverges. And then if it equals one, that's the inconclusive. So we definitely hope that doesn't happen because then we have to do something else, right? Probably won't happen because they told us to use ratio tests, right? It's only when we take the liberty to do it ourselves that you might <laughs> get inconclusive because there might've been a better test to use. So let's try it out. Oh. Another thing that I kept seeing people do, and I mentioned it in class, don't do it, don't do it, but it still happened. Um, well, I'll do this one because this is the one that a lot of people messed up on. If I have this and I'm trying to plug in n plus one, it is not this. No, it's not. This becomes n plus one and it's three times that. So it should be n plus one times the three in factorial, which means it's actually three n plus three factorial, right? And there were a couple of people, I think in the remote class that, that didn't do that correctly. So be very, very careful. Um, so here, I don't have a problem because it doesn't have the number, right? So it's just be n plus one factorial over five plus one, and then the reciprocal of the original. So let's see. This is gonna be n plus one times n factorial. I have five to the power n, that's five to the power n times five to the one, and then times n factorial. So these are all multiplied. So that guy can cancel with that guy. This guy can cancel with that guy. I end up with n plus one over five, right? Oh God, it did happen to me. What happens as n goes to infinity? Aha, uh -huh, I'm gonna get infinity, right? Oh, it's not one, so that's good. But it is greater than one, isn't it? Which means that the series does what? Divergence. Yes. Here you go. I was scared for a second thinking it was gonna equal one. I'm like, no, it's not. <laughs> good, good, good. Oh, now we're in chapter 10. We made our way to chapter 10 again. Okay, so this one does have some directions. It says, sketch the curve represented by the parametric equations and write the corresponding rectangular equation by eliminating the parameter, okay? What you don't wanna do is eliminate the parameter and then draw the graph um, because you won't know the orientation of that graph if you do that first, okay? All you'll know is that this is what the graph is, but you won't know which way the arrows go, okay? In order for you to know which way the arrows go, think of T as time and start going from like the beginning of time and then going on forward. 
However, it's not exactly time, so you can use negative values for the moment, okay? It's not a real world application problem just yet. So if I would let, I think the one I did was I did T, X, Y, and we, I just stuck with negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So it's progressing through that time, quote unquote time. There's no such thing as negative, right? But <laughs> I noticed on all the graphs and web assign, they had values over there on the negative side. So we have to see if any. So if I plug in negative two cubed, that's gonna give me eight, actually negative eight. If I do negative one cubed, I'll get negative one. Zero cubed is zero. One cubed is one and two cubed is eight, right? For the Y values though, you're squaring these T's and then dividing them by six. So negative two squared is four, but four over six is two thirds. And then negative one squared is positive one, but over six is one six. Zero squared over zero is, oh, I'm sorry, over six is zero. And this one's one six, and this one's also two thirds. Okay, so now we can draw it. Um, one six, two six, three six, four six, five six, six six, so that's one. Um, and then I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And I don't have any negative y values, so I'm not gonna mess with the with the little marks on the bottom. So let's see, x is negative eight and y is positive two thirds. So that's one, two, three, four, six. Then negative one and one six, zero, zero, um, one and one six, and then eight and two thirds or four sixes. So it went like this and then like that. Now it did go in that direction, right? As I start lower to you, it started here and then went that way. So make sure your arrows would be facing toward the right, okay? So this is part of the answer. Now the second part said for me to write a corresponding rectangular equation by eliminating the parameter. So normally what I do is basically substitution when I do this. So I will take X equal to T cubed and solve for T. So when I do that, I'm gonna have to do the cube root on both sides, right? Now I didn't choose to do it to Y because in order to get T by itself, wouldn't I have to do square root? And then I'm gonna get plus or minus. And I don't want that business, that stuff to happen to me, okay? So I chose this one with the T cubed because you don't get plus or minus when you do cube roots. Um, so you get the cube root of X equal to T. And then now that is gonna replace the T in the other equation. So instead of T squared, it's gonna be the cube root of X squared which can just be rewritten as X to the two thirds over six. And so that is the rectangular equation. So uh, minus the orientation, the little arrows, that is the graph of this function, okay? It's just normally when it's in like this form, you don't know what way it's going, what direction it's going in, it just is. Number 26, I'm missing something on number 26. 
Dun, dun, dun. Oh, I'm missing the equations. Hello. So here's the paper that I uploaded. Um, I'm going to need to put a note in the other classes, in the online class, because you don't have, um, here on number 26, you don't have the equations. So the equations should have been x equal to t squared minus 4, and then y equal to t squared minus 2t. So from an online class, I'll put a, a little note of that. Well, actually, I'm going to post this video in that class, too, so I guess I don't need to <laughs> if they watch the video, right? Now, I don't know about that. Some people don't watch these videos. Not many people do. Okay, so when I write this, I'm going to write my two functions, and then I'm going to write those points. And the directions were find an equation of the tangent line at each of these three points, okay? So the first one was zero, zero. The second one was negative three, negative one. And then the third one was negative three, three. Now remember, in order for me to find the tangent line, right? It's y equals m 10 x plus b, whatever that y intercepted, okay? So I need to know what m tan is. m tan is given to us by the derivative, isn't it? Okay. So this is basically dy dx evaluated at your point times x plus b. One term. It's just in order for me to get that number, I have to do the dy dx and then plug in the x and y. So remember with these guys, when you're doing your um, derivative dy dx, these are not in terms of x, they're in terms of t, right? So we have to do dy with respect to t, and then we do dx with respect to t. So in my case, the derivative of y with respect to t would be 2t minus 2, and the derivative of x with respect to t would be 2t minus 0. Don't cancel your t's, right? They cannot. You can factor out a t, a 2. And then because they're factors, you can cancel out the 2's. But you still have this as your expression, OK? So we're going to have to repeat this process three different times, but I'm going to start with part A at 0, 0. So that means m10 will be this thing evaluated at 0, 0. Oh, no, it's not evaluated at 0, 0. It's evaluated the t value associated with 0, 0. Because do I have an x to plug in? Do I have a y to plug in? No, right? So we need to figure out what is that t value that I'm going to have to plug in, OK? So some systems of equations temporarily. We know that x is 0, and we know that y is 0. And for me, I'd rather use substitution. If I get 4 over, I get that t squared equals 4. And then if I solve for t, oh gosh, unfortunately, I get t equals plus or minus 2. So let's go see what we get here, because it may just be one. Remember, it has to be the same solution for both, right? This one, if I solve for t, it implies t equals zero or t equals positive two. Which one is consistent with both of those equations? 
positive two is the one that they have in common. So both of these together mean I can only pick T equal to two. So now I know which T value I'm plugging in. So I have two minus one over two, which is one half. So, so far my equation is Y equals one half X plus B. But in order for me to figure out B, I need to plug in X and Y and I have those, right? My point is X and Y. So if this is zero and this is zero, what is B? Mm -hmm. So then all that together, this together means that my equation is just one half X because I don't need to write plus zero, right? So this is the answer for part A. We're gonna have to do the same thing, but now that we know the process, it might not be so long, um, but we can do the same thing for V. So this time we're doing it at the point negative three, negative one. So let's go do our system of equations. So X is negative three, which should be T squared minus four. Um, y is negative one, which should be T squared minus two T. So the top one, if I add four, I will get one equal to T squared. And if I square root, I'll get T equals plus or minus one. Here, if I move the one over, I will get zero equals T squared minus two T minus one. I mean, you could use quadratic formula, but I'd rather factor it. Actually, I don't think you can factor it, can you? Nope. So we have to use a quadratic formula. So I get two plus or minus four plus four, which is eight over two. You could type this in your calculator, it'll simplify it for you, but it should tell you it's one plus or minus square root of two. Are these responses anywhere near, oh, I could have done it by factoring. I have an error. Do you see my error? It probably could have been done by factoring, but I screwed up. Yes. So this is a negative one, right? And so when I moved it over, it should have become plus one. Now that I can factor. So screw all of this stuff. I should have known too. And I was like, this is not coming out right. But that I can factor. It'll be T minus one times T minus one. And it don't matter which one you set equal to zero, you're going to get T equal to one for both, right? So according to these two, the only one that matches is t equal to one. So let's do our m10. It would be um, one minus one over one, which is just zero. Well, that might make my equation easier then because it would be zero x plus b, which means y equals b. And what is the y value of our point? negative one so negative one is b put these two together and you don't have an x but you do have negative one for b i don't think i'm gonna be able to squish the next one in there. So let me grab a sheet of paper. So we can do C. And this one's at negative three and positive three. So negative three equals T squared minus four and positive three equals T squared minus two T. Well, that's the same thing as before. It's the exact same equation. 
right? So I don't need to do all the steps again. I know T is going to equal plus or minus one. The bottom's not exactly the same though. So if I minus the three over, I get zero equal to T squared minus two T minus three, which can factor. And I get T equal to three or T equal to negative one. So which one matches here? It would be the negative one, right? That one doesn't have three. So then that means M10 is going to be negative one minus one over negative one. Remember, I'm plugging it into this formula right here for M10, okay? So negative one minus one over negative one. Well, that gives me positive two. So Y equals positive two X plus B. I need to figure out B. So Y is a positive three, X is a negative three. And if I add six, I get B is equal to nine. So together we have two X plus nine. Now, if you were to have this problem on the test, you would only get one point, not three points, but different things happened in each one of these, right? In this one, you have a B, right? B is zero. Over here, you don't have X because M was zero. And then over here, neither one of them was zero, okay? So it's a good example because it covers all the different cases, okay? But you wouldn't get all three. You would just get one scenario. So this problem says, and I do know that there's one like this on the test, on the final. Like I remember seeing this problem. I don't think it's sine. It might be a different one, um, maybe cosine or tangent or something different. But I do remember seeing something where you had to convert it um, to its polar equation. I mean, this is a polar equation. You had to convert it to its rectangular then once it says it to convert it to rectangular and sketch its graph, I would do it in that order. Because me personally, I would not know what this is supposed to look like, okay? But if I make it in the rectangular coordinates, then I might be able to tell what it looks like. So remember, there's three basic conversions. You have that um, X equals R sine theta, Y equals R I did this backwards. This is cosine. And then this one is sine. And then you have also that x squared plus y squared equals r squared. One thing that we notice here is that I don't have r squared, right? And I have sine, but I don't have r time sign, do I? Okay. So in order for me to use these guys, I feel like there needs to be an extra factor of R. So as long as I do the same thing on both sides, I'm okay. So I'm going to actually multiply R on both sides. When I do that, this becomes R squared and this becomes 3R sine theta. Now I can use my conversions. So R squared says it's X squared plus Y squared. And then R sine theta is just three Y. And as long as I have X squared plus Y squared, this is a circle, but it's gonna be a little bit algebra to remember on what is the center and what is the radius of this circle, right? In order for me to graph it. But I do know it's a circle because I have X squared plus Y squared. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to move over that 3y. And then we're going to do what's called completing the square. So you would have to add b over 2 squared, which in this case is, there you go. I would have to add a negative 3 over 2 squared, which means I need to add a 9 halves. So I'm going to add 9 halves to this side and 9 halves to the other side. That way I'm not changing the value, right, of the equation. We did the same thing on both sides of this equation. Now here, it should factor into y, same sign as this, minus, and then whatever the number was before you squared it. And if you notice, it actually has the minus with it, doesn't it? So it should have just been minus and then 3 halves. And you could foil it out if you're like not sure. You're like, uh, you're telling me that's what it is, but is it? <laughs> You could foil this out and combine your like terms and you should get these three terms, okay? Oh, I have an error. What's three halves squared? Uh-huh, nine fourths. It's not gonna change anything really, just the start on the outside. But I definitely need to have it correct right here. So this tells me that my center, remember this can be written as x minus zero squared. So the x value of the center is zero. The y value of the center is this three halves. Always use the opposite sign, okay? And then the radius squared is nine fourths. So then what's the radius? Mm-hmm, three halves. Or for me, when I'm drawing it, 1.5, right? So 1.5 units. And the same thing here, this is 1.5. So when I draw it, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. I'm gonna do zero, and positive 1.5, that's my center. And if my radius is 1.5, I'm going to go out 1.5 units in all four directions. Okay. So I'm going to go down half and a whole unit. I'm going to go up half and a whole unit. I'm going to go to the right, um, a half and a whole unit, and then a half and a whole unit. But I went out, right? one and a half units in each direction. And then it's just a matter of trying to connect your dots so that they look like a circle. It's not the best looking circle, but it'll do. And we've done both things, right? We've converted it um, to an equation and we have graphed it, okay? And in WebAssign, it had a bunch of choices and like the circle was up here, the circle was on the side or the circle was down below or the circle was over here, but you kind of had a clue that it would, would be a circle, okay? But at least now you have like the steps to get that center and radius. Now this one's the directions say, find the area of the region. And then the region is the interior of this. Okay. We know what that looks like. It looks a lot like number 27, doesn't it? A lot like number 27. So I know that it's gonna look like a circle. But where is this circle gonna exist? I don't know, and I need to know because I need to find those bounds and all that good stuff, okay? Um, also, just to talk about it right now, since I already have an image of a circle up there, 
Um, if I had to find the area inside that circle, couldn't you take the area of this and multiply it by four? Won't that give you the whole area, right? But then I don't have some weird issues with trying to figure out who's the top, who's the bottom, all that good stuff, okay? So real quick, I know that the formula has to do with the half. I just don't remember exact um, area in polar. Well, it's not even typing in. There it is. Well, that looks weird. There it is. So A equals one half from A to B R squared D theta. Now these A's are theta values, okay? So essentially what I have to do is I have to figure out what theta values is gonna give me the entire circle? Okay, I mean, I could figure out just a section of it and do it, but if I'm gonna leave it in polar coordinates, then I might as well just do the whole thing. What angle am I gonna use? How do you get like the whole circle? What angles do you have to use? Think of your unit circle. Where does the angle start? And where do the angles end to get the whole unit circle? Zero. Exactly. So if I want the entire circle, I have to use R in this um, interval from zero to two pi. I'm sorry, not R. Why did I say R? The angle has to be from zero to two pi. So let's see, we have A equal to one half, zero to two pi. And then R is six sine theta. D theta. Oh, I forgot my square. So R squared. I'm wondering if this is gonna give me zero. I don't know, let's just keep going. I'm thinking these bounds are not correct, but I'll double check it if it doesn't come out right. Um, This would be, what is that, 36 sine squared? And then if I take the 36 out, it would be 18. Yeah, I think I am gonna get zero. I think the bounds are not right, this circle. Let me grab another sheet of paper and let me figure it out. So if theta equals zero, zero degrees or zero rates, it's gonna be R equals six sine of zero, which is six times zero, which is zero. Okay, good to know. Then theta equals, I don't know, pi over four. What is sine of pi over four? I think it's square root of two over two, right? Yeah. And then theta equals pi over two. So sine of pi over two is one. 
gives me six. Um, pi over four, three pi over four is next. So sine of three pi over four. Yeah, I only need to do it until it gets to zero again. And then three pi over four, four pi over four is pi. And that would be what sign of pi? Is it zero again? Yep. Okay. So see, I went from zero to zero, right? So it should only be pi, pi not two pi. And the reason why I can foresee that that's going to be a problem is because eventually when I take the, um, eventually I'm going to have to use the power reducing formulas, right? Which have cosine in them. And then when I integrate those cosines, they're going to turn into sines, right? And if I plug in zero and two pi into sine, I'm going to get zero and zero for both. Okay, so that was kind of like where I'm like, uh, uh this is not right. So I'm going to change this to pi. And then we'll see what happens. I think that will fix it. So I took the 36 out and instead of sine squared, we're going to use that formula, the power reducing formula, which I think is a minus actually. And since this is theta, this would be two theta over two. Now I can kick the two out, the denominator, but 18 over two would make that nine. And then all I have is one minus cosine of two theta, d theta, which is going to be nine And then what's the integral of one d theta is going to be theta. The integral of cosine is negative sine. But because my angle is not just theta, I have to divide by that derivative, which is going to be two. So it's actually nine theta minus, nope, negative and negative would be plus nine halves sine of two theta evaluated from zero to pi. So let's see what we get. We get nine pi plus nine halves sine of two pi minus nine times zero plus nine halves sine of two times zero. I get nine pi, sine of pi, two pi is zero. So times that is still gonna be zero. This is zero and this angle is zero. Sine of zero is also zero. So I literally just end up with the nine pi and that's it. And that one is actually the answer. So make sure you have the correct balance. You wanna start from somewhere and then end up at that same spot. Okay. I think that was probably the hardest one, but that's the last one out of everything. And I think, I can't remember exactly, but there's anywhere between 10 to 16 problems on the final exam. But I have to make sure that I can do the exam. I think it's in 40 minutes because then you get times three, which is 120 minutes. And actually only have 110 minutes. So I probably need to make sure I do it like in 35 minutes for me. Okay. 
and that will give you like an extra 10 minutes to, I guess, like review your answers or whatnot. So that is it. Does anybody have any questions about anything? It doesn't have to be about this review. Well, okie dokie, I guess we finished a little bit early today. Oh, only 10 minutes, so <laughs> sorry I had to use all your time. Um, let me stop the recording here.